Uh, Gary Galeno, Grindel61, has decided to join us tonight. This is a special broadcast. We're here to wake you up, tell you the truth. Uh, we're not going to tell you what you want to hear. We're going to tell you what you need to hear, folks. Uh, Gary, go right ahead. All right. Well, I'm here tonight because uh, I want to talk about Donald Trump, uh, the President of the United States. Uh, something that's been really weighing on me uh, really the last couple of months, I kind of came to a realization, and that is that Trump is unstoppable. And uh, we heard Mike Pence say that. Who was he talking to? Was it, a, was it Netanyahu he said that to? It was a hot mic. I think it was over in Israel. And I think it was Netanyahu yeah, or somebody so, really high up in, in the Israeli government. Right. So, uh, And that is the truth. Uh, Donald Trump is unstoppable. And I notice some people, uh, they think that's a great thing. Uh, but the problem is, is uh, people in this country do not understand uh, what his policies are. So on the, the one end, half the country, the supporters of, of the president, their attitude is, well, if Trump put his name on it and he signed it, then it has to be good. It, it must be America first. Therefore, I don't need to look into it. I don't need to question it. it it's, it's, the, it's the right uh, thing for the country. So that's half the country. The other half of the country, what I refer to now as the alleged opposition, they, they are not opposition at all. And what I mean by that is when I talk to Trump supporters and I bring up these issues, they always say, well, the media is so against him and all these entities and, and everyone's trying to stop him in the movies and the entertainment and the music and whatever, right? Everyone's against him. But the reality is, if you talk to anyone that really is against Trump, why are they against him in the first place? Well, they're against him because four years ago, he said that Mexicans were rapists, murderers, and drug dealers. That's it. There's really no other reason why they are against him. They're against Donald Trump because he's a mean-spirited, racist, bigoted, old white man. That's why they're against Donald Trump. They're not against him because he's pushing the, the because he funded the real ID national ID card. They're not against him because during the campaign he was he made anti-vax statements and is now making pro-vax statements. They're not against him uh, because uh, you know he's he's pushing red flag laws. They're not against him uh, for the USMCA bill that he just signed. They're not against him for, for pushing 5G. They're not against him for spending more than any other president than ever before him. They're not against him for growing the government more than any president before him. They're not against him for funding the military industrial complex more than anyone has before him. They're against him because he's a racist. That's it. That is not opposition. If the opposition actually could sit down and lay out the points that I just made, we might actually be able to stop this guy a little more frequently but instead half the country says well if he did it it must be good the other half says well he's racist so the only people that are opposing him are people like me people like joe and you know we're the ones that are laying out the real issues and because the opposition refuses to even look at his policy issues all they look at is is oh race all day long there is no opposition because no one's actually opposing what Donald Trump is doing. So with that said, uh, recently we've had this coronavirus thing going on and we've also had impeachment going on. And during all of this distraction, Donald Trump signed, it was passed by the House and the Senate and it was signed by the president. He signed the USMCA bill. USMCA is not United States Marine Corps of America. It's the United States, Mexico and Canada agreement. Now, Obviously, I, you know, I'm aware of the scam of, of Washington, D.C. I actually lived there for a while, so no one has to explain to me how big of a scam the whole political structure is. But here's what really opened my eyes very recently about how big of a scam. Th this whole thing is a total psyop. This coronavirus combined with the impeachment, with, with the fact that they had all that going on, and then he signs this USMCA bill. I've talked to four people that are, well, one that's not, but three others that are Trump supporters. And I asked them as a test, do you know what USMCA is? Nobody knows what this bill is. It's a success. It's a success, exactly. So, And, and I said that during uh, Obama's tenure, that the, the most transformative legislation that I, that I had seen in my lifetime was Obamacare. This USMCA is on that level. This is transformative legislation this will go down. This will this will be his legacy, and so this was the psyop. I don't I don't have the dates you know off the top of my head, but on one day 
the House of Representatives voted to impeach the president. Okay, so they're they're telling the world that he's so bad that we have to have him removed from office, that he's a criminal, and that we're indicting him, and that we have to have a trial. That's what the House of Representatives said on the day they impeached him. The very next day, that same House of Representatives, led by Nancy Pelosi, they passed Trump's USMCA bill. So if he's so bad and he has to be taken out of office, then why are they giving him his biggest legislative achievement of his presidency? The one where he's going to go out on all the rallies now and say, I got USMCA passed. And one more thing about that, too. During the campaign, very early on, Donald Trump was saying, that I'm going to cancel NAFTA. I'm going to cancel it. That didn't last very long because probably someone talked to him and said, we're not, we're not going to allow you to do that. And that would have been America first canceling NAFTA. Then he changed his tune and he started saying, I'm going to renegotiate NAFTA. And that's what USMCA is. USMCA is NAFTA part two. Now, a lot of the Trump supporters, when I try to explain to them what this guy is doing, they, they either say, it depends on how sophisticated they are. The lesser sophisticated Trump supporters, they say, oh, African-American unemployment is, is at record lows in the stock market, in the economy, and that's all they have. Because again, no one in this country actually knows what his policies are. The more sophisticated Trump supporters, they'll tell me, oh, he got us out of TPP, and he got us out of the Paris Climate Agreement. Now, here is the con and the psyop of Donald Trump. So during the Obama tenure, the, the, uh, they were pushing the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which if that were to have passed, that would have put the United States and I believe either 11 or 12 other Asian countries into what would be a Pacific Union, very similar to the European Union. I don't think I have to explain to anybody here what is the European Union. It, it, we would be in that kind of agreement. There was a lot of opposition to that because everybody said, and, and they called it Obama trade at the time. And everybody knew that was in the know that that was going to eliminate American sovereignty. And then Hillary Clinton, uh, there was a, a video of her where she said that the Trans-Pacific Partnership was the gold standard of trade deals. And that's what, and I was pushing that video like crazy because I was saying at the time, if, if we don't elect Trump, because Trump was against Trans-Pacific Partnership. That's, he said on day one he would kill that deal. And then Hillary tried to pretend like she tried to walk back that original statement, but it was already too late for her, at least in regard to that particular uh, issue. So day one of Trump's presidency, he actually kept his promise. He, he signed uh, some kind of order saying that we're no longer in the Trans-Pacific, that we're no longer going to do it. And it's a little complex. I don't want to get into all the details of it, but there was something called TPA, and there was also TPP. TPA was when the Republicans conspired with Obama. This was Paul Ryan. And what they did was they gave up all their authority on the negotiations and gave it to the president. And, and, and so Obama was a sole negotiator on Trans-Pacific Partnership at the time. What Trump did was he basically canceled TPP, but the TPA, which was the, the Congress giving up their power to the president, lasts for six years. So if we have a new president uh, in 2020 or 2020, that president, I think for one year, could still reestablish Trans-Pacific Partnership. So uh, it's not dead yet, but basically what Trump said was, he says, he basically killed the negotiations. So we're all happy. Trump gets us out of TPP at least for four years. And then what does he do? He does what he's been doing for the last three years. They took Trans-Pacific Partnership. They repackaged it. They gave it a different name. They changed the countries, and, and they just passed it. I also mentioned the Paris Climate Agreement because the exact same thing has happened. He signed uh, a, a something or an order or whatever they do saying that we're not going to participate anymore in the Paris Climate Agreement, and I'm not even sure if that's even happened or not. Uh, there was a hard deadline sometime in 2019, which has since passed, and... I know for a fact that if we really got out of that, there would have been a big lefty media meltdown, which there wasn't. So I don't really know if there, uh, if we really got out of the Paris Climate Agreement or not. But aside from that, they then took the Paris Climate Agreement, repackaged it, renamed it, and that is in the USMCA bill. So the USMCA bill is a combination of the Trans-Pacific Partnership 
and the Paris Climate Agreement. So for a few more minutes, if you don't mind, I want to explain what's in this bill. So the first thing, I'm going to stop go you. ahead. This man is a political science expert. Continue, please. All right. So the first thing that I want to go over that I had not gone over previously, I don't, I'm not sure if it's actually new because I know things were pulled out and put in and all that in, in between all this process, but this is new to me. And uh, one of the people that I worked with uh, fighting this uh, informed me on this. In this bill is something called the National Infrastructure Bank. And the first time I was ever exposed to this concept was about three years ago. We went to a, uh, 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 an event with a local congressman, Pete Aguilar. He uh, represents the San Bernardino County area. We went to one of his events and taped it. And in that event, he was pushing at the time, this is back when Obama was still president, he was pushing at the time something called the National Infrastructure Bank. And I went, whoa, whoa, what's that, right? And to this day, I still don't really know what that entails because it never happened back then. It was never really explained what it, what it was, and it still has not been explained what it is. But I'm going to speculate on, on what it means because uh, I'm very familiar with this world of Agenda 21, Agenda 2030, and the USMCA bill is Agenda 2030. And I want to explain very briefly that most channels that I watch that discuss this issue don't know the difference between Agenda 21 and Agenda 2030. They, they just think they're the same thing, and, and they're, complete, they're two separate programs, two separate documents. So the 21 program, the one from the early 90s, 92, that, that Bush got us involved in, that was all local. So when your local city council is pushing this environmental crap, that was Agenda 21. The 2030 program is when your national government and internationally it gets pushed on you, and that's what the USMCA bill is. It's, it's part of the 2030 program. So the National Infrastructure Bank, this is what they are, are what I think they're going to do. Pretty much every city in the country is bankrupt because of pension obligations and unfunded liabilities. And so as a result, they got to take the little free grant money anytime they can. Well, I'm of the opinion that the National Infrastructure Bank is going to federalize the grant program where cities take grants. And that's what makes us part of the 2030 program. So let's say your city wants to redo the streets or they want to fix some kind of infrastructure, when they go apply for grants, they're not going to apply at, at a more local level. They're going to apply with the National Infrastructure Bank. And then you only get the grant if you uh, uh, go along with the terms of the National Infrastructure Bank. And because the National Infrastructure Bank was created in an Agenda 2030 document, that means that you have to follow Agenda 2030 protocols in order to receive that grant money. And so, like I said, almost every city in the country is bankrupt, so they have to take this money. It's literally dealing with the devil. So that's in the USMCA bill. Another thing in the bill is, uh, and really what this whole thing is, so uh, we're no longer going to have Pacific Union. We now have North American Union with Canada and Mexico. And it states in the bill that this is an economic merger of the three countries. So Donald Trump goes out there and he says that this is the greatest economy we've ever had, even though GDP is only 2.2 or whatever it is. It's the greatest economy ever, the most prosperity ever. But then he signs a bill linking our economy with that of a socialist country, Canada, and a third world failed state of Mexico. So do you think that by us doing that, we're going to pull up Mexico, or is Mexico going to pull us down? And I'm of the opinion that they're going to pull us down with them. So we are now merged economically with the United States, or with uh, Canada and Mexico. All you guys that are for the wall, that are for, <laughs> that, that, are for uh, uh, that are against illegal immigration, the European Union, when that was created, that was about the movement of goods and people. That's what this is. This is, the, this is about the movement of goods, services, and people. So if you think that we're going to stop this immigration or, or illegal immigration for that matter, President Trump just completely signed the death nail of that policy. There's never going to be a wall now. There's never going to be any kind of real uh, 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 fight on illegal immigration. And there never will be any deportations going forward because think about it. What was Trump saying in the campaign about uh, NAFTA? He said that it was a bad deal 
and that Canada and Mexico, they got one up on us. So that means that in order for them to negotiate with us, we have to give them something. And there's only one thing that Mexico wants from the United States, and that is they want us to take their people that they don't want. So all you people that have been telling me lately that Trump's in great on immigration, that he's building the wall, he literally just signed away any – forever, they're, they're, unless they overturn this document. They're, they're never going to do it. I mean, it's open borders for all. Just That's what the European Union is. It's open borders for all. Easy travel across the 20, 22 countries or whatever it is. That's how it's going to be between the United States, Mexico, and Canada. So it's an economic merger of the three countries. And then the, uh, the last thing that, that's really important that I want to cover, and this is all part of the Agenda 2030 and Paris Agreement stuff, unlike NAFTA, uh, NAFTA that did not have this, there is a chapter in USMCA on the environment. And it states in the environmental chapter that the purpose of USMCA is the furtherance of sustainable development. So Trump can go out there and say, I'm against climate change, I'm, I, global warming's fake, but he then goes and signs the document stating that as a nation, we're going to focus on fighting climate change because sustainable development is the strategy put out by the United Nations to fight climate change. So for those of you that have watched my videos on the Grind All 61 channel for years and years and years, you saw all the crap that they were doing in my city. You're going to now see that on, on, not, a, not only on a local level, but it's going to be pushed on a national level. So that, that, and so like I said, this, that's the PSYOP. The PSYOP was coronavirus, impeachment. I mean, come on, impeachment. I mean, we all knew they were never going to uh, oust this guy. He just got acquitted today. He, just today, it just happened. And in the middle of all of that, this bill got signed, and nobody's talking about it. And you don't see the TV talking about it. None of the supporters are talking about it. The haters aren't talking about it. It got passed in the dark of night, and it's just going to be one of those like, oh, I, I guess it, Trump's going to be talking about it. But as he's talking about it, no one's going to know what it is, and they'll they'll only know what it is when he goes, oh, I redid NAFTA, and his his red hat wearing supporters are going to go, yay, this is what we voted for. No, this is not what you voted for. You did not vote for an economic merger of Canada. United States and Mexico, and then let's throw the Paris Agreement in there, because that's that's what's in there. And when I say Paris Agreement, it's not necessarily the agreement with uh, that whole with Paris, where we gotta pay fees and fines and and money to these other countries. But we're going to the, the three countries have committed to fighting climate change via the fact that it says that the purpose of the document is to further sustainable development. Uh, it's pretty much well known at this point that uh, Dick Cheney was the real president during the George W. Bush years. And very similarly, Donald Trump is not the president of the United States. But President Trump's job is to go out, uh, wild some feathers, uh, do speeches, and sign and sign the bills. But it, So it says the real president, Jared Kushner, was a key player in securing the United States-Mexico-Canada agreement uh, U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer told reporters on October 2018, I've said before and I'll say it again, this agreement would not have happened if it wasn't for Jared. Kushner is a key player in securing a new trade deal with China. After seeing how Kushner was successful in securing USMCA, Trump instructed him on, uh, on Trump instructed him to work on getting a new trade deal secure with China. So we got Kushner over in China. You got Kushner over doing USMCA. He's over in Israel in the Middle East securing a, a, a new two-state solution, peace plan. The guy is everywhere. It is now the next day after the completion of the live stream with Joe Imbriano, the Fullerton Informer. And after we finished the live stream, I realized that I forgot the most important point that I wanted to make about the USMCA deal. So the point that I wanted to make that I forgot is in the USMCA document, it states that there is going to be the creation of a USMCA unelected international commission that will comprise of representatives from the United States, Canada, and Mexico. For longer time viewers of my work, you probably remember SCAG, the Southern California Association of Governments, SAMBAG, San Bernardino Associated Governments, which were the big regional agencies in my area. 
This new international commission is essentially global international SCAG, SCAG at the international level. And this commission, well, there's two things I want to say about this commission. The first one being is the commission will have the ability to alter the USMCA deal at any time. So if you watch Sean Hannity or you see a Trump speech, you're going to hear them say that it's good for the farmers, it's good for the American worker, and there may be a little bit of truth to that. However, this commission once formed, and this commission is forming immediately. This is not something that's going to happen five or eight years down the road. They are forming this commission immediately as in this year. This commission will have the ability to take anything that is actually good in the agreement and essentially scrap it. We have given up our authority as a nation to this commission. The other thing this commission will have the ability to do is it will supersede Congress on all matters relating to Canada, Mexico, and USMCA. And if you know what the European Union is, there is a European Union Commission, which is just like this USMCA Commission. And that's why all the countries in Europe lost their sovereignty when the European Commission was formed, because the European Commission had the ability to tell these governments what they can and cannot do, and how much restitution they have to pay in taxes, fees, and whatnot. That is why the United Kingdom, Great Britain, just got out of the European Union because they were sick of this crap. And isn't it interesting that as the UK is pulling out of the European Union, the United States is entering a North American Union with Canada and Mexico. So this international commission, this is the crux of the entire deal. It's about giving up our authority and our sovereignty to rule over ourselves. And now individuals that none of us have ever heard of from within our country, as well as Mexico and Canada, will be able to vote on policies that will affect you here in the United States. Now, one last thing that I want to play for you, I'm going to play a video. This is Senator Jeff Sessions back before he became a compromise attorney general. And he was our champion on the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And he lays out very succinctly what the Trans-Pacific Partnership is. And as I stated in the live stream, the USMCA is the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It's just been rebranded, renamed, and instead of having Asian countries, we have North American countries. But essentially, everything in the Trans-Pacific Partnership is what's in the USMCA. So whenever Sessions says TPP or Trans-Pacific Partnership, just substitute that with USMCA and the same is essentially true. Why do we have to create a transnational union? An institution that has a power, as I will explain, to impact the laws of the United States of America. It's not necessary, according to the trade uh, a representative who's negotiating and advancing this legislation on behalf of President Obama and who's advocating for it, it will be a living agreement. And that means that the entity itself, the commission, will then be entitled to make it say different things, eliminate provisions it doesn't like, add provisions it does like. In fact, the commission is required to meet regularly and to hear advice for changes from outside groups, from inside committees of the commission, uh, so that they can update the situation to uh, change circumstances. It is a breathtaking event. Uh, it says it's designed to promote the international movement of people, services, and products. Basically the same language used to start the European Union. Uh, in fact, um, I have referred to it as a nascent European Union. I don't think that's far off base. Well, it's not just a trade agreement with one friend and ally, South Korea. It's 12 nations in the Pacific. As soon as that is inked, 
we've been told uh, and brought forward for passage in the Congress. And historically, if we give trade promotion authority, the agreements have always passed that are presented. Once that one's done, we will have a transatlantic agreement. And this transatlantic agreement, I suppose, also will have some sort of commission, a transatlantic union uh, with powers to discipline and set rules outside the powers of the United States Congress. And then there's going to be a services agreement that's already been talked about. It's been leaked. Somebody leaked it. The other two are secret and can't be seen by the American people. Some of my colleagues have been saying that the trade promotion authority that the president is so desperately seeking, he's been hammering and bludgeoning his members in the Senate and the House to get them to not vote their conscience, but vote with what he wants. They say we should pass it because it restricts the power of the president. Well, give me a break. Uh, if this were true, why would the president want it? If he could do all this he wants to do without Congress, why isn't he doing it anyway? Uh, the entire purpose of Fast Track is for Congress to surrender its power to the executive branch for six years. Legislative concessions include control over the content of the legislation. The president negotiates it. He brings it back. We can't amend it. He controls the content of it. The power to fully consider the legislation on the floor. It's filed on one day, voted the next day. The power to keep debate open until Senate cloture is invoked. On any other legislation, you have to get cloture vote. So to gather on TPP, TTIP, and TISA, these three trade agreements that we know are going to be advanced on the fast track, represent the goal of advancing the unrestricted global movement of goods and people and services. The European Commission, this is how they started, how they were formed, explains. Uh, and, and, so the European Commission has, is explaining now TISA, the second, uh, uh, presumably the second major trade agreement that would be submitted after the Pacific Agreement. And we'd move to the Pacific, uh, uh, European realm. And this is how they explain what it means, quote, TISA is open to all WTO members, World Trade Organization members, who want to open up trade in services. China and Uruguay have asked to join the talks. The EU supports their applications. TISA, of course, is the services agreement. And apparently it'll be worldwide. Anybody, even China, could be admitted to it. And the European Union Commission specifies that this services agreement, TISA, will be modeled on the General Agreement on Trade in Services, GATS. And this provides insights into how TISA will affect U.S. immigration procedure. When the United States became a member of the WTO in 1994, it signed on to the GATS and committed to issue certain numbers of work visas each year, immigration visas. Congress's ability to control the United States' temporary entry programs has therefore been curtailed as it would open up the United States to foreign lawsuits in an international tribunal. In other words, they made an agreement on immigration visas under work ideas as part of GATS and the WTO, and it it violates and complicates our ability to enforce American immigration law. What about this union? What kind of powers is it that we're talking about? I'm of the belief, since the president hasn't been a strong advocate of trade and his supporters, many of them oppose this kind of trade agreement, I'm becoming to believe that the primary part of his understanding of the importance of this legislation and why he's breaking arms and heads over it is the union, this international commission 
that has powers that he believes will allow him to advance uh, agendas. So for too long, the United States has entered into trade deals on the promise of economic bounty, only to see workers impoverished. Industries disappear. Manufacturing jobs decline. And we've been on a steady decline in manufacturing jobs.